Go Canes! This is Dan White. And this is my preview of Saturday's game in College Station against Texas A&M. The game will be broadcast on ABC at 9 p.m. Following my commentary, I'll include a few key highlights of the Texas A&M game and Appalachian State and a clip from Coach Mirabal about his statements on the game. Stay tuned for that. First, I want to discuss Jimbo Fisher, or should I say Dumbo Fisher. There's a lot of hype around him. This was supposed to be the year for Texas A&M. His $110 million contract, that's right, $110 million dollars. He's the fifth highest paid coach. His record in four years is 9-4, eight wins and five losses, nine and one, and eight and four. That's not exactly what Texas A&M was bargaining for. Whoa, Nelly! Over the last four years, he has signed four top 10 classes. Now he's in year five, and he lost to Appalachian State with one of the most talented rosters in college football. Texas A&M was kicked up and down the field, and this falls directly on Jimbo. He's out of excuses. We did not execute and play at the level we needed to, and that's my fault. That's as a head football coach, that's your job to have your guys ready to play and put them in position to make plays and let them to do it. So at the end of the day, that's that's on us opportunities, but got to coach it better. That's on me. A&M looks unprepared to play. They've been in the red zone. They've been in the red zone only once this year. He's had no major bowl victories. He still runs an offense that he did at FSU. That's like a horse and wagon today. Saturday's loss wasn't the byproduct of one player. It was the byproduct of a coach who has slipped behind in the top tier of elite coaches in the sport. Fisher's decision to shuffle his offensive staff didn't pay off either. And so far, neither did his decision to play four-star quarterback, Haynes King, who is in his third year. Now, he played one game last year, and he was injured for the rest of the season. But the loss to App State is the type of loss that a year five coach is supposed to avoid. I wouldn't be surprised if he's fired if he loses big to Miami, or even if he loses a close game. His current buyout, now get this, his current buyout would be an astonishing $45.6 million if he's fired without cause. Nebraska's coach, Scott Frost, whom I'm sure you all have heard about, was fired on September the 11th, the day after losing to Georgia Southern. His buyout was $15 million. Do you think A&M today is having buyer's remorse with old Jimbo? The Aggies lack everything. They lack an offensive identity, they lack a coach known for troubleshooting, but in 2020, he signed the number one class in college football. Jimbo was brought in to compete for national championships. He has all the coaching power, all the assistant coaches, all the athletes, and all the resources. They had all the advantages, but mediocrity is his standard. There are no ranked wins under his tenure at A&M, not one. And there are many group of five losses. His offense looks anemic. Maybe he needs a blood transfusion. They look anemic week in and week out, and his line is bullied at the line of scrimmage. The offense has shown no signs of improvement. Instead, it's regressed under Jimbo. And the offense is supposed to be his strength. He was a quarterback in college and he's doing all the play calling. He had four losses last year, no playoffs, and get this, 
He was given that huge raise. Unbelievable. The results do not shout inspiration. Texas A&M paid Appalachian State $1.5 million to play them. That was probably their budget for the rest of the year and maybe some into next year. Paul Feinbaum, ESPN's pundit and sage, took a shot at Fisher while speaking publicly at the Little Rock Touchdown Club. He said, that was the question before the season. Who's the best third team? Who's the best third team? Some people thought it was a and M. I'm not here to make fun of Jimbo Fisher. His record does that already. Since taking over at Texas A&M in 2018, Fisher has a 35-15 record, winning either eight or nine games in each full season. While those results are solid, they don't quite reach those of the SEC elite like Bama and Georgia. The Aggies entered this season with high expectations. They were ranked, they were ranked number six in the preseason poll. Number six. And they were expected to be in the mix for the college football playoff. Thus, a loss at home to Appalachian State is especially tough if it prevents Texas A&M from meeting those expectations, which there's no way they can. Appalachian State has given Miami the blueprint on how to beat Texas A&M. Miami brings a 2-0 record into this game and A&M a 1-1 record. Miami has beaten the teams they are supposed to win. Texas A&M has lost the ESPN game day for this Saturday. They moved it from College Station to App State in Boone, North Carolina, where the featured interview was supposed to have been that great coach, Jimbo Fisher. Now, during the game against App State, Texas A&M ran only 38 plays, less than half what App State ran. Texas A&M looked out of gas in the fourth quarter. They had less than 100 yards passing. Haynes King, the quarterback, Jimbo gave him no vote of confidence in his presser. King's third year in the program this year. Last year he was out with an injury and he's not good enough. He's three and one with a 60% completion percentage. Maybe he'll be benched for Max Johnson, a transfer from LSU for Saturday's game against our Canes. Texas A&M only had 186 total yards and only nine first downs. They are abysmal on offense. They got outplayed in every phase of the game. They were out-hearted, out-hustled, and they had no fight. You can't do worse on offense than A&M did this past Saturday. A&M has no rotation of offensive or defensive linemen, and frankly, his line looked spent in the fourth quarter. Now, A&M has linebacker issues. There's no depth. They have problems stopping the run. App State absolutely wore them out on three and four yard games. And then from time to time, they'd break a big one. This is an ACC Miami versus SEC Texas A&M matchup this Saturday. Now, A&M has a lot of speed. Running back Devon Arcane had a punt return against App State for a touchdown. He has world-class sprinter, sprinter speed. You take away that touchdown that Devon had, and you only have seven points that A&M earned on offense. My prediction is like buying stocks. Who buys a stock that has a history of sinking? Texas A&M stock is sinking, and I'd say stinking. I predict that Miami will beat Texas A&M 31 to 10. Now I had predicted Miami would go 10 and two with losses to A&M and Clemson. I'm changing that. 
and Miami will go 11 and one with a loss to Clemson. But after seeing Clemson play Furman, we could go undefeated, win the Coastal, and get in the playoffs. Clemson looked shaky against the Furman Paladins. Furman had the ball for 34 minutes and 45 seconds to Clemson's 25 minutes and 15 seconds. Furman lost 35 to 19. It seems to me that our chances of beating Clemson are going up, up, and up. The only issue of going undefeated is stumping our toe on a foe that we are supposed to beat. Miami has done that in the past. Thanks for watching. I'll have my review of this game posted on YouTube next week. May God bless you. Appalachian State 17, Texas A&M 14. Aggies, a 20-point favorite, lose at home to a group of five team. Let's look at Jimbo Fisher's status in college football. I think most of us would consider him to be a top five coach in the country. He arrives a few seasons later at Texas A&M. They back up the Brinks truck into his driveway to say, we want to win championships at A&M. They have not won a national championship at Texas A&M since 1939. No conference title since back in the Big 12 days in 1998. Jimbo Fisher's in his fifth season. He has not come anywhere close to winning an SEC championship. He's 35 and 15. All right. Jimbo Fisher in four years has really done nothing. His last season here in 2021, eight and four. At the time that he was given that contract was the highest paid coach in college football. They paid him to win championships. This is his fifth season. He's got all the resources you could ever want to build a championship team. Even that 2020 squad that went nine and one, that's the crowning jewel, nine and one, top five finish, won the Orange Bowl. Yes, there are a bit of smoke and mirrors there. The team that they defeated in the Orange Bowl, North Carolina, didn't have its two top running backs, two top wide receivers, best off, uh, defensive player. They only beat two teams with winning records. One was the dysfunctional Florida team under Dan Mullen. The other was a 6-5 and five Auburn team. So that wasn't even a tremendous team or season. The wide receiver play at Texas A&M has been subpar under Jimbo Fisher. And he's supposed to be a guy that creates offense, that knows offense. And he's not creating offense. Against Appalachian State, that obviously is prompting this video, the historic win by App State. 17 to 14. This Texas A&M Texas A&M team did not lose because of the defense. The defense was fine. Barely gave up 300 yards, only 14 points to App State. And this is to a team that just scored 61 against UNC. So on the flip side, the Texas A&M offense could only score 7 points. The offense only produced one touchdown against an App State defense that gave up a zillion yards and 63 points last week to North Carolina. Nine first downs, 186 yards of total offense. And they've got Miami coming to town this weekend. Team total talent ranking is about seventh in the country right now, and they should be able to beat Appalachian State. Miami comes to town on Saturday night, and Texas A&M could go into SEC play with already two unexpected losses. I didn't think it was a foul, but Jalen McLeod needs to be smart there and realize there's no benefit to hitting the quarterback once the ball's gone. King held the mesh too long. Quarterback just needs to make a decision there. Peoples to the outside, stiff arm in the open field, Cameron Peoples still going, touchdown. This partner, we've talked a lot about the talent on the A&M defense, offense, their recruiting class, but the one thing that you can't measure is heart, and I tell you what, App State 
has a ton of it. Bryce takes it, falls to the ground, and Appalachian State has done it again. Wow. They come to College Station and they take down the number 16. This Saturday at the College Station, obviously a team we have tremendous respect for. Uh, their coaching staff, their players, their program, a lot of tradition. Great players, a really explosive football team, and uh, our guys are really excited about the opportunity ahead of us. So that being said, open questions. Coach, uh, what type of mentality, approach, culture does a program need to have to go into a road environment like you're going to see Saturday and compete at the high level? Well, I mean, anytime you go on the road, you know, you've always heard that term business trip and what does that really mean? Well, um, best way to put it, I guess, is that, you know, you work on toughness and discipline and resiliency and execution and leadership throughout the course of what, winter, right? Fourth quarter program, springtime, the summer, fall camp and everything else. And you've got to make those things real because that's what you have to pack in your bags before you take a trip to a place uh, to play, you know, an excellent football team like Texas A&M. So the mentality is that of a business trip, understanding the task at hand and understanding what we must do to give ourselves our best chance on every single play. Do you feel like you're going to learn a lot about your team in that regard this week? Because obviously it's something you haven't experienced yet with this team. I think every day is a learning experience with our guys because every single day for us is new. So. I think we'll learn as much just because we have the past week and the week before that. Because that's the key for us is continued improvement. I don't think you proclaim your identity, you know. I don't think you, you go out and you say I'm this or I'm that. I think you go out and you play it and you show it what you do on the field. You know, your film is your resume, right? It's not your tweet or your t-shirt. So I think in a couple of the two games that we have played, they are certainly on both sides of the ball um, up front that we're showing progress. We're working our way towards being a more physical team. Uh, we're starting to use our hands better. We're coming out of our hips better. You know, I say that like a broken record because that's part of it. You know, you got to come off the ball. You got to strike people. And um, and there are really there are really good moments of execution. Other ones that are close. Other ones that are not so close. And so we we tend on when we come together on Sunday, we don't shine a positive light on stuff. That's not real. You shine a, a realistic just light and take a realistic snapshot of what you are and we progress a lot since the springtime you know when we first got together and we feel that there's a lot to be um, improved upon and it starts with the preparation and I'm talking about every scout team card you know I'm talking about if if they're running his own pressure and that punch contain guy is really wide and works right through the shoulder of the tackle and then pops out. It's got to show up like that on the card and our players have got to see it. And that's on every coach, every analyst, every GA in the building. You know, it's no different than a prize fighter, you know, training for the big heavyweight fight, right? If he's training against competition that's not pushing him, he's probably going to have a rough day in the ring, right? Same thing for football. So we've got to continue to elevate the standards of every part of our program. And that's the exciting part for us. You know, our players like that, our staff really likes that. So um, it's been a good start to the week. So I think everybody wants to, you know, watch teams that are playing on big stages and see what type of progress teams have made. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think anytime you get an opportunity to play a great team like this on a national stage, of course, there are a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on you, you know, and certainly, uh, you know, recruiting, recruiting is affected by a number of different things, uh, but progress and performance, right? Increased, you know, success rates are typically one of the, the more critical factors in the recruiting cycle. One thing we're not going to do is, uh, we're always going to be straightforward and blunt and honest. We're not going to create drama or narratives. That just ain't it. We're not going to have that here. And we've got to get to work and continue to get better and better. We're going to choose not to create narratives and drama out there in our program. Certain people hit their stride at certain times. It's unpredictable. It's probably one of the most imperfect sciences there is in the world. When's a, when's a guy going to peak? When's a guy going to hit his stride and be a great player and a great contributor? You're talking about guys that are all contributing and doing a lot of good things. Sometimes some guys are a little bit ahead of others. 
sometimes, you know, there's some ground to be gained and some guys are making it up fast, others are not. Honesty and transparency. No nonsense and no BS. And then we have a lot of guys that can play a lot of different positions and we expect them to play at a high level. And just as importantly, we expect a strong competitive response from our guys. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I mean by that is when guys are competing, instead of taking a turn where maybe a guy may choose to pout or to create an attitude or to create, that's not it. It's not for this program. Competitive responses, when guys see competition, the whole purpose and intent of competition is to make everyone aware that nothing but their very best is going to be good enough. So or, that's what we mean by that. Or what's your takeaway from what App State was able to do at Texas A&M? And when you've been on that side, when you're expected to win a game and you lose, what do you expect out of what A&M is going to return with this week? App State played a really good game, and that was a really hard-fought game. Both teams made some incredible plays, you know. And um, the second part of the question, I'm sorry? When, when, when you're expected to win a game, What do you, you come tell, back with? You tell a lot from a team how they respond to a loss like that. So when you've been on the other side of that, if you've got a big loss that you probably figure your team shouldn't win, what kind of response do you expect from Texas? What team? kind of response? I mean, there's, there is a, uh, you know, the business side of football is something that is not talked about enough in college football, but performance is everything. You know, this is, uh, there is no discrimination in playing time, right? The guys that prove it play. The guys that, uh, Let's just say game day is not an experiment. It's not a let's see if a guy can do it. It's, uh, it's guys that have stood the test of time through practices and shown that they can help us. Coach, what do you think of the Texas A&M's offense, the challenges that those skill guys possess, even though they had a struggling game last game? They, they have the most or at least as explosive as anybody else in the country. You know, if you look at their track times, I mean, those are legit times, 10-1, 10-6. 10-5, and these aren't, you know, some guys are smaller slot guys, but there's big guys. You know, they've got big speed all over the place. Uh, they're extremely physical and big up front and athletic, uh, so they can knock you back and cover you up. Their, their tight ends are very versatile, you know, as blockers, as receivers, they can stretch the field, they can knock you back. Uh, just a very, very dangerous offense, you know, and uh, certainly we're, we're very well aware of their capabilities. Sorry, right, noise. noise. The noise factor, mm -hmm. how it feels, 100,000. Um, is that something, that especially the younger players, just have to live through to, to, you know, to do it right and not make mistakes and stuff? I know you practice with noise, but it's not the same. Sure, I think it's more, I think it's 115,000, if I'm not mistaken. It's up there. It's well over 100. But if you've never seen it before, never practiced in noise before, and if you let it get in your head, it will affect you tremendously. And if you practice in it, if you really stress the importance of how you signal, how you communicate without having to verbally correct, because you're not going to be able to do that, right? Uh, we understand that, you know, they create an unbelievable atmosphere, which is exciting for our guys, quite honestly. You know, it's exciting. I mean, come on, when you're, when you're growing up and you play college football, you want to play in games like this. Um, you recognize their tradition, you respect it, them and their program. And you can't wait for the opportunity, you know, to go find out you know, where we are as a program. So, uh, but we're training it, obviously, you know, I'm sure uh, the residents of Coral Gables are really happy about, you know, the speakers blasting all the time, but uh, it's part of our process, so we'll continue working at it. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Go Canes! Thanks so much for watching.